whatever happens, I've got to fit my life into here. And we have a lot more space than we used to. We used to have nine or 10 guys and three, boom, boom, boom. And now we've got two, they call these condo bunks. So you can actually sit up in them. There's a little DVD player that flips down, little iPod station. And uh, this is what we call a junk bunk. It's usually filled with uh, junk. <laughs> Woo, watch your step. Whatever you do, don't smell these clothes. <laughs> we have three days off, off in Nashville, so these are going straight to the dry cleaner. Every drummer needs one of these, a Honda Element. The seats come up on the sides. There's always drum stuff in here. There's always new and old drum heads, because for some reason, people love signed drum heads. So I usually get the band to sign them. And then there's always a collection of snare drums and sticks and cymbals. And this is what I do, boom. Done. I moved to uh, I, I moved to Nashville in '97, March of '97, after a series of of auditions with um, well, in the space of two weeks, I auditioned for Trisha Yearwood, Dina Carter, and um, Barbara Mandrell, and that was a weird kind of law of attraction event. I found out that Trisha Yearwood was looking for a drummer. I came here to do all these auditions, and one audition didn't lead to a gig, but it led to another audition. And that audition led to another audition, and I was shaking hands and stuff, and 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 I said, "Dude, I've got to get here." You know, I was actually planning to moving, planning on moving to LA. I had bought the Folder's Guide to LA, and was going to start learning the freeway systems and the different parts of town, and trying to find a place. And um, then I said, "You know what? I got so close. I met a lot of people that really liked my drumming, and they said the only reason I didn't get gigs was because I didn't live in Nashville. Living in Nashville was really gonna." help my cause so I gave my band two weeks notice and packed up my one little set of drums and my Toyota pickup truck my little black cat and we came to Nashville Um, well, today we're working for ourselves, so it'll be truly a labor of love, and it, I'm sure we'll be here till the wee hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Until everybody just starts losing it. But probably we'll budget it out so we do two songs today, two songs tomorrow. Yeah, we're working with a girl named Natalie Ann, and she's from, from Alabama. These are my Sonar S-Class drums that I got. This is the first Sonar kit that I got when I was in that band Rush Low in 2003. When I took these out of the box, I was so excited because, you know, sonar drums had kind of disappeared for a little bit there. And we're bringing them back. And the cool thing about Natalie um, that's a little different from some of the artists we work with is we're actually cutting all of her originals. So all the stuff she's written or co-written. And a lot of times, you know, we bring an artist in and produce them and pitch songs, get songs pitched to us and all that. And so, and not Natalie, she happens to be a phenomenal phenomenal uh, songwriter so very cool very cool very exciting yeah now the, the band shows up yeah, the, the, the melody and the main part of the music is here well Kurt yeah no, without the bass there's nothing well without the kick drum let's can we can program all this later we'll do all that yeah <laughs> <laughs> bass oh brother fast forward this part it gets no fucking respect <laughs> ever <laughs> If you ask a 10-year-old kid, what do you want to play? They're going to say drums or guitar. No one ever says bass. I'm going to change that. You can, you can put that in your documentary. You can put that in your documentary. I was wondering why everybody was so quaffed. Then I saw there was a camera. Well, I just got and we're playing for a girl. And this was Brian Ann instead of Nally. And we'd probably be here in, in pajamas, but... <laughs> this was Brian Ann. Brian Ann. I'm not sure we... I've been playing uh, Rich for 10 years about, which is, uh, it's been awesome, man. I mean, he's, you know, he is the man. I mean, I was, seriously, I tell him this all the time, but I was probably half the bass player. You know, every, every great bass player needs a, a better drummer, you know? That's just the way, the way it works. I mean, it, you know, the drummer needs to be the, the foundation, which, you know, he is, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been fortunate in, uh, 
He's been pretty lucky himself on this. Secret ingredients. Yeah. Ingredient. They can't do it without me. I do everything. See, what they don't realize is after it's all over, I go in and replay everything. They give me like a nice little grid, you know, a little, little something to work with. And I just go in there and play the way, play the stuff the way it should be. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. This is where the magic happens, right here. I tell these guys what to play. I, I, I said, I said, I said, I said, you guys give me a nice little grid to work with, and I go in and redo. We are your canvas, you are the painter. <laughs> So trying to just do big, open, repetitive things for the for the engineer to get sounds, and if he hears anything that's that's not sitting right with him, then I'll adjust. And these are real, relatively new heads. How long have you been singing? Oh, since I was tiny, <laughs> like maybe probably three. We should do the blue steel. Do one blue steel. Uh, one blue. I got a hat this on. It's blue. not really blue steel. This is, is it. You gotta look down. I'm, I'm not gonna steel. do it. I'm not gonna do it. That's the. I'm very blue fortunate steel. to have created a reality in which I get to spend nearly every day with my best friends. You didn't smile? I smiled. I didn't smile. I smiled. You smile? Yeah, I'm gonna do one else. On the occasions that I work outside of this team, I still try to create a positive scenario for myself by surrounding myself with like-minded individuals that are driven to succeed and are equally committed to their craft. Yeah, me too. But we're still handsome. Close. And drums still sound the no, same. No. We're gonna replace them anyway. I like this one better. Inspired by that one note in that Lionel Richie song, All Night Long, that one Tom hit made Lionel Richie a lot of money. That's what the that's what the, that's what the session drummer said on that John Robinson. They were pretty, pretty much wasting our time. They're gonna get replaced anyway. All the drums. So. I'm just kidding. He didn't oh, like that. So he did not like that. <laughs> Everybody's touchy today. Nice to you too. That. Everybody's touchy today. Got me every time. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Tell me what goes through your mind times like this when you're not playing, waiting to play. Anxiety because looking at the clock, thinking we got a lot of work to do. Hmm. It is telling you. You're right. That's that's what I think about. You Feel better once we get this first track noted. And then the panic will sit in about producing it right, <laughs> followed by hours of pure panic about the mix. And <laughs> it's just lots of fun, man. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. Yeah. And then the and then the uh, inevitable thousand listen to's of to the mix and then obsessing about well that too loud, is that too quiet? And never being happy. <laughs> it's a good life. Yeah. <laughs> Go team. Yeah, producer. Yeah. I want you to. Are you tensing up? Huh? Are you tensing I want you to. I want you to. Punch him I want you to. As hard as you can. These aren't gym muscles. These are farm <laughs> muscles. <laughs> no. Dude, I want you. You know what I mean? Don't hold back. Don't, don't hold back. These are farm Dude, muscles. Don't hold back. No. Oh!
Oh my <laughs> god, that's solid, dude. There's no game. Do this one. Watch this one. Ready? Do this one. It's like. <laughs> and he eats <laughs> all day long, like <laughs> you hoos and. Watch him again. Watch him again. Hit the. Let me try it. Do it hard. No, but I mean, dude. I watch what David do. Watch. All right. It hurt my wrist last night. Don't hurt back. Don't hurt your hand, David. You played guitar. It hurt. It's hurt my wrist. Did it so hard. Did it so hard. Hard as a It's a hard. Oh, Wait, say that even. This is a typical week for, week for us, the way we tour in Nashville. So we're playing with Jason Aldean. We'll get on the bus on a Wednesday night at around midnight, unless it's, our destination is far away. Sometimes we'll get on as early as, you know, 6 p.m., um, which still allows us to do a 10, 10 o'clock session and a 2 o'clock session in Nashville. But So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, we do sessions, we do showcases, I teach or we do our production work. We track two songs, we got vocals, um, and uh, basically we'll probably go right up to the, to the last second and then we'll have to get over to Brentwood and, and get on a bus and go out and do our Thursday, Friday, Saturday shows with, with Jason Aldean. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Alright, yeah, poor guy's so gonna be really successful drummers and I won't name any names I would love to but um, really successful people that have been in the business 20 30 years playing on hit records and they have the worst attitude and I have no idea how they've been able to sustain a career maybe their playing is so good that you would be willing to put up with their sad sack curmudgeon -y attitude but if I was a producer or a player or an artist and I smelled that attitude at the first downbeat, you're out. They get threatened by the, by the young guy. Hey, I'm not the youngest guy in the band anymore. I used to be the youngest guy in the band. But when I see a young guy and he's on the bus for the first time or he's excited because it's his first session, I try to support the guy, you know what I mean? And not vibe him out because I've been vibed. And it is not cool, you know. So I just try to be nice to everybody from the downbeat, you know what I mean? When I go to a recording session, man, you know, I know the secretary's name. I know, you know, I know the second engineer's name. I, I mean, I try to know everybody and be nice to everybody. I tell you what, that second engineer is going to be a first engineer and then a producer before you know it. So be nice to the guy. That's just the way this whole thing works. Nobody stays at the bottom of the ladder for everybody, ever. Everybody wants to climb, you know, and the idea is to maybe have a lot of people that have common interests and climb together. <laughs> hey, uh, can we run just the intro to make sure that I'm getting what Brian's looking for? No! Can't run the intro. All right, thank you. <laughs> This is a typical working day in Nashville where I am cutting five songs in three hours, which gives you roughly a half an hour per song. And if you're a drummer, you've got to get the song in one or two takes. Working in the studio comes down to what I call the three P's. You're playing, your personality, and your people skills. You have to get in, get the job done with a smile on your face. And a lot of times it comes down to your bedside manner and how you communicate. Can you communicate effectively on your instrument and off of your instrument? Fireman right there and <laughs> turn. Time is money. Time it. There it is. Hey Stevie, <laughs> tell them what what a session is. You, you're 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 on. Uh, in my view, it, it is um, thirty minutes of just boredom, followed by ten minutes of sheer terror and pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, caught us in that moment of boredom. I'm gonna get some animal crackers. Brian Davis, father, husband, poet, musician, wow. songwriter, recording artist. Uh, we met in uh, 05. Mm -hmm. We used to play the Sutler, this place over in uh, off of Eighth Ave. Yes, I miss it. He took a liking to my drumming. And um, he started calling me for his sessions, and I got started calling Kurt and Tully and 
it's where, where we are like four years later. Yeah, and now they're the only guys I use. That's correct. It's there. There's something so, to be said for loyalty. It does exist. These guys are out on the road, obviously, with Jason Aldean, and uh, but they they bring that same integrity and that intensity into the studio, and that's something that shows up on tape. And you can't you can't get that oh, unless you go out and do it. And that's the thing. A lot of guys in town don't go out on the road and work, and these guys do, and they bring that back to the table. And it makes sense for me. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, buddy. Heel toe. Kick ball chain. Heel toe. Preach your brow message. Take a song away. Original. Yeah. Hey, hey, and go to town. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be real shit. Hey, brother. Oh. Their mom's prayer. I'm so good. I don't have to listen to the song anymore. I just, like, go and look at the numbers. Fumble. Yeah. Very important. Very important. Supposedly. That's really leaving. I was reading something recently that said if you want to be an expert at anything you do, it takes 10,000 hours of practice. I don't know if I've put in 10,000 hours. I know that I know how to play a song. I'm a good, competent drummer in all sorts of styles. I'm an entertainer. I, I have the desire to continually improve and um, I always give people my best. And I think that that if you're a good musician and you have the desire to give people your best at all times and you're always playing at the top of your game and you have a great attitude, you will always work. Uh, today we're working on another track for um, one of our artists, Finesse. It was this killer uh, rapper from Alabama, and we're adding our dance rock elements to his music. There's like a little rattle with the washer, it's pretty cool. One, two. Wrong hole. Hate that. Uh, David, our fourth partner, David Fanning, who brought us uh, finesse and said, "Hey, you got to check this kid out. Kid out. He, you know, he just he flows. He raps. He writes his all his own stuff, and it's just killer." And we did a four uh, side project on him. I don't know about six months ago or something. Everybody we played for was just freaking out. You know, it's all real instruments. And usually coming from that world, everything is programmed, and we're just having a great time. And hopefully, we'll, by the end of the day, we'll have another time. I've been rapping since my junior year, I guess it was 2005, 2006, because hardships and whatnot had me writing and it elevated. And uh, I met David Fannin last year, who was in with the band, so now we're doing this rap rock project with the Three Kings, who are absolutely amazing. McCarthy knows that one. We've done four songs for the last EP. We're doing four more now. Then we're coming back in and finishing the full CD. So we're we'll gonna see where it goes from here. How you like working with them so far? I love it. it is. I, I won't lie, I was nervous. In December we went in. Me being a rapper, I didn't know how open-minded they would be. So I went in there extremely nervous. And they, they grew on them. And we turned it into what it is. So I'm, I love it. I wouldn't have another team in the world. We record finesse a lot different than any other artist. We start choruses, and then we do, I mean, uh, verses, and then we do choruses, and then we do the bridge and the intro, and then s yeah, slice it all together. So we record backwards.
<laughs> Save that. <laughs> yes. Dude, That's great, dude. Great stuff, buddy. Never know what you're gonna get here at Old New Voice. White rappers with country players playing rock rap. We <laughs> think, Jim. My favorite kind of stuff to play right here. Oh yeah. Yep. What's that? Just uh, just program feel, but live bass. Like some of my favorite stuff is like Adam Clayton from U2. All that kind of like dances, kind of club, kind of bass parts played live. It's fun. What's up? What's up, buddy? Hey. How you doing? Richie would go to his different drum teachers, he was very challenging to them. The one guy said that he goes back and he visits his teachers on occasion and he goes, Rich, you always made me work. I used to have to be prepared for you to come in because you asked all these questions and I had to give you, you know, you challenged me. His teachers would tell him this. Well, he was a, he was a reader. He really should have been a writer. Mm -hmm. He can write amazing things. Uh, was reading Clan of the Cave Beer, this thick book, like in fifth grade or something. He got, I go, honey, I, I don't even know that I could get through that book. But the teacher gave him all these things. He really was a, he, he has that kind of mind, a very creative very, mind. Very focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And focused. Very focused and, on his drum. Even, even at Tech, when, when he was in the drum line at Texas Tech, you know, to show how focused he is on his music. He'd be in the drum line, and we'd say, "Rich, well, Rich, who's the, who? Who are the who's the Raiders playing today?" Oh, I don't know. <laughs> What's the score of What's the game? The score? Who won? I, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, he was just worried How about you the were drum there? line. <laughs> just, he was so worried about the drum line and the performance of the drum line. You know. <laughs> for a long time, even when he was in Nashville, if he wasn't going to be playing for a while, he brought his pad home with him and his sticks, and he would practice. Yep. That amazed me. It's like, honey, can you take a break for a while? No, I don't want to get out of. I don't want to get out of the rhythm of things. I got to right. practice. I mean, and he, he goes in the closet. Yeah, he would go in the closet. In the closet. In our, in our home with in El Paso. His little pad. So he wouldn't bother us, and he would practice. He there. would sit in the closed closet and and play on the drums. He was very close to my mom, and I think my mom said to him one day something about when are you going to get a real job? Yeah, I think yeah he was talking about he had done this and he had done that, and he was thinking about doing this, and she says, "Well, that's great, but when are you going to get a real job?" And, and he has never forgotten, forgotten that. And so he just wanted to prove that he could do this. Yeah. Right. Was he ever into sports at all? You um, know what? He did speed skating as a child. Really? Right. Yeah, uh-huh. And then we moved to the South, so that kind of went out the window. And he played um, softball for he a while. He was pretty softball. good at yeah. softball. Right. Mm -hmm. But mostly he was a reader, and he loved all his Dungeons & Dragons. and Yeah. So... I was a dungeon master. Moving on. Personally, if you put up two 19s or an 18 and a 19, yeah. I'm pretty happy. Okay. You know what I mean? And then I can just tweak from there. This is actually my favorite symbol. If I if I had this on every kit, the saturation, and it's and I just do the Van Halen thing, two of the same, 19, 19. What we're trying to do today is get the amazing staff of Soundcheck kind of trained and all the everything is all kind of marked on the carpets and everything, and so. No matter where we are, or what what time of day, it, it gets gets set up, and it's like a phoenix rising. Sabian has been so badass. It's really cool to have all the different colors and the sonic palette at my fingertips. Thank you, Sabian. Got the three kits. I got a sonar kit that has a 26-inch kick drum, the sonar kit that has a 24-inch kick drum, and then 
a set that has a 22 inch. These are the three kits that are kind of constantly in circulation. And then I have another kit on the road with Jason Aldean that's a, a, a nice birch kit, 24 inch kick drum. It's kind of got like a spotted, gaudy kind of a leopard skin thing. So like I said, I'm the lucky to have all this very expensive toys. And I totally appreciate it and I totally take care of them. Big, big believer in Murphy's Law. Every kit has two of everything. So there's two, two pedals. I have extra hi-hat clutches, tools with me at all times. Um, those are my favorite snare drums right there. Yeah, look at this, Jim. This is, what happens here is, is that the right side of the stick bag is sticks that have been massively chewed. And then the left, this is the left side, is on sticks that are more on the, on the newer side. And what I do is I treat myself, like this is a really important gig, like we did the Brian Adams thing, or we did the stadium. I treat myself to do a pair of sticks. But late, lately, everything has been important. So I've got like all these sticks that really need to be, you know what I mean? They're kind of in nebulous land. But as you can see, really, also, I don't. Ha I have one set of brushes and then some mallets. These never get used on Jason's gigs. I have my own locker here at the world famous Sound Check in Nashville, Tennessee. And what's going to happen is in the next 10 minutes, there's going to be an A kit, a B kit, and a C kit that's going to be all quarantined like a crime scene. As you can see here, the guys mark everything. This is going to go to all my recording sessions. An electronic rack, some specialty cymbals, some hand drums, all my shakers and tambourines and weedos and kibasas. Up top are things that either don't get used all the time or things that don't, I don't need to get to all the time. Extra rugs, snare drums that I want to sell on eBay, extra heads, Curtin Tully. They have their gear stored over here, so Soundcheck was nice enough in this economy to give us a group rate. So 90% of the time I'm working with those guys. So the publishers of the record company get a discount by having all three of us on the session. And Soundcheck was, I think they're really cool and smart about doing that. And we do almost all of our rehearsals over here. So when we have to rehearse with Jason or another artist for a, for a showcase, um, Soundcheck, free of charge, will grab my drums, set up my drums in the rehearsal facility, and I'm all, we're all on site. Everything's in-house. So, so New Voice Entertainment and the Three Kings are all in the same building, which is probably the smartest thing. The days of schlepping a lot of gear have finally seen, the, seen their day. Jason is a super talented, humble, and sincere person. When you see Jason in concert or in the media, you are seeing the real Jason. He is very down to earth and approachable. He loves to have a great time and is very supportive of all the guys in his band. The music we make is a perfect radio friendly country rock beast that is a combination of Jason's influences and his band's influences. He encourages us to be ourselves, to be authentic, to have a great time, to dress the way we want to dress and be the players we want to be. It's authentic, it's genuine, and it's real. And that's why it works. When Kurt Tully and myself were in the band Rushlow, it was more of a learning experience. We were told, cover up your tattoos, don't be so wild, don't be so outspoken. Our originality was squashed. Maybe that's why the band didn't work. We, we first heard ourselves on the radio. I mean, we were all on the, bu the bus crying. We're like, oh my God. Oh, we're on there. Like, yeah, exactly, right. Oh my God. That's right. We made it. That's right. <laughs> Little did we know we did not make it. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things come down to opportunities and you have to be ready for that opportunity. Now, if you if you push and push and push and network and are passing out business cards all over town and somebody finally gives you that opportunity to say, you know, I met this cool kid last night, he's young, he's hungry, he, he's the right price, you know, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get him on this recording session. He goes to his record goes to the recording session, his drums don't sound good, the pedal's squeaky, the toms aren't tuned well, the bass drum's not muffled, his snare drum's ringing, um, he can't play styles, he can't read Nashville number charts, he's not quick on the uptake, he's just folded, he just folded on his opportunity, his first opportunity, and it's so, that's a first impression, and it's really hard to fix a bad first impression. Kids that, that just want to move it, you know, from Iowa and they're 21 years old and they have no experience playing in top 40 bands or playing styles or They don't really know how to play a three and a half minute song really well, and they don't have the right gear 
it's not really the town to cut your teeth in, you know? A town like New York, Los Angeles, or Nashville, you want to come to town prepared. Here it comes. Here it comes. Uh, I, bet it's an, I bet it's an E, because all main hitter songs are an E. Jim, we are here today at uh, Fool on the Hill Studio in world famous Berry Hill. It's this little suburb of Nashville, and there's like every all these little houses, and they all have recording studios and mixing rooms and mastering studios. And um, anyways, Tully and I, Steve, everybody, we're doing a session today with um, Amy Daly, who um, is a recording artist. And I met her in uh, 1997, and she was my first, very first gig in Nashville. She said, it's Tuesday, we're leaving on Friday, I need for you to learn 65 songs, we're not going to rehearse, we're going to rehearse on the gig. And we, I learned them, and we left. Amy Daly today. And then here we are, 13 years later, we're still working with her. She's, she's like, get to work. And don't use a piccolo snare drum. She hates piccolos and China boys. I get hired a lot for my musical intuition. You know, I, I would like to think that I have a deep well of musical knowledge to pull from. And in Nashville, it's all about the song. You got to decide what you're going to do and do it quickly and get to it because time is money in the studio. Sometimes people have very concrete ideas of what they want and can lead you in the right direction. Other times they just say, do your thing. I met Rich about 10 years ago and I had a, a cover band and we were on the road all the time. And um, I just called him up, and I didn't know it, but it was his first week in town. And, and I was like, do you want to go on the road with me for five weeks? And he was like, uh, sure. So I went and watched him play a gig and gave him 50 songs to learn. And he hopped in the van, and we were gone for five weeks playing all over the country. And then I always said, whenever I make a record, I'm going to get you to play on it and stuff. We were always kind of, sure, sure. And um, it happened. He played on my album called It's Time. And this past year, we put it out. and. Um, you know, we're, I still call him all the time for demos and stuff. I think he's awesome and a great friend. I don't know. I'm trying to remember how I discovered YouTube, but when I just when I discovered it, and I saw the drum videos on there and how people were promoting themselves playing drums from their bedroom. I was like, well, imagine what this can do to prefer a professional player. People were just fascinated by behind the scenes stuff, and I fall in the in the cracks because I'm not a bedroom drummer, but I'm not um, Virgil Donati or. Will Calhoun or like one of these or Steve Smith or one of these huge drum god clinician guys. I'm a blue collar drummer. I'm a working guy. I, I've been working at this for over 20 years and it doesn't matter what kind of style it is or what the gig is paying. If it's music and I like the people I'm playing with, I go do the gig. <laughs> At 10 a.m. I was at a recording session at a world-class studio. We went from hard rock, alt rock, music row, country pop, old style country, and R&B. Then I made my way over to the listening room and I backed up four killer songwriters. Now I made my way over, I'm making my way over to the Rutledge tonight and we are gonna, I'm gonna be playing music with a gal named Emily West. like in 01, 02. As a matter of fact, I played the showcase at Douglas Corner, world famous Douglas Corner, where Trisha Yearwood got signed and a lot of famous country recording artists got signed. And I played her showcase and she got signed to Capitol Records that night. I'm back at the Rutledge playing with Emily and it could have been Madison Square Garden. I don't care, I would play with her at Sears.
I've known Rich since like 1999, I think. I met the, the Three Kings um, when I was just a tiny fetus. I was there when they were all living together in one crack house, but they didn't smoke crack. They just smoked women. <laughs> I'm kidding. Rich was, you know, using uh, Dollar Tree cleaning supplies to clean the house every Saturday. And now they're like these amazing musicians that everybody in the world wants to play with. They threw this Halloween party and you weren't allowed into the, to the, to the Halloween party unless you were wearing a costume. So somebody wore this leather jacket and spiked up their hair really, really tall and he's like, Hey buddy, here's my demo reel, I'm Rich Redmond! And he got into the party. Shut up, Rich trying to talk goodly about you. Thank you. You know, I've been playing with Jason now for about five years. I met him in 2000. So from 2000 to 2004, we did showcases for almost every label in Nashville, major and indie, four or five times. So it was showcase, showcase, showcase. And did tons of demos with him and tons of fun little gigs where we would load up everybody's minivans with gear and amps and drums and drive to somewhere in Georgia and play some dump and you know he finally you know the whole time I had, was working with him I was working with a million other people you know that's what you do kind of have as a drummer you have to spread your seed because you're only as good as the people that you're playing with nobody wants to go see a solo drum show you know I mean how many people maybe Buddy Rich you know so yeah I was spreading my seed and then in 04 we cut Jason's record and then it you know, thank God, Hicktown went went was a top ten single, and it, it provided the the germination for what is kind of flowered. And uh, you know, we really tore it up. Those first two years, we did two hundred dates a year, and we we had nine guys on a bus, and we were our own drum techs and backline guys, and it was like. It was a very involved day to try to get up, set up your drums, you know, clean, tune, change heads, do a sound check, still make it to the gym, get business done, come back, do the show, break down your drums, and do this four or five days in a row every day. This is the home away from home. Tomorrow's a relaxing travel day, and what happens is that after like 12 to 16 hours, the, the, Ron, our amazing driver, has to stop and sleep by law. And so he usually drops us off at a mall, and we go, ha ah, the food court, and then to, you know, a movie. A band movie. I'm really looking forward to it. Really, this is a dream. Man. This is a dream job. And um, it, it happened for me because I was persistent. And that's, you know, that's usually what I tell younger kids. It's like, yeah, you got to have your paradiddles and your flams down. you got to be able to read music. But, it, but you have got to be able to be a people person with persistence. <laughs> this crazy business. Business.